Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. Our guest today is Michelle Merwin. Michelle is the Director of Quality at FormLogic and a very good friend of mine. Uh, Michelle, welcome to the pod. Well, cheers, Spencer. Great to be here. Cheers. Good to be there. <laughs> yeah, I've been wanting to do this for a while and we've had to push it back for various reasons. So right. exciting to have you on. Um, seriously, you're one of my favorite people I've ever encountered in the industry. So. It's great to be here. You know, um, always good to kind of kick it with you. Yeah, so, likewise. Let's chat, shall we? What do you want to talk about coffee today? Talk. <laughs> the coffee talk. Five 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 four 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 four. <laughs> anyway, so, so I guess like a good starting question that I tend to ask everyone is like how you got into what you're doing. So how do you get into quality? That's like oh, Spencer, quality. You know, everyone just gets sucked into quality, right? That's what Zach was saying too. Right, so quality, I actually got into it many, many years ago at a company called Gardner Denver Nash, now bought by Ingersoll and something like that. Anyway, back in the day, um, it was really important for us to get ISO certified, ISO 9001, because in little tiny Elizabeth, Pennsylvania, the shop that I was at did 70% export. So it's a fabrication facility making chemical process equipment and ISO was this big thing and we had to get it. So the president of the company came down from headquarters and said, hey, uh, there's this quality thing and we need volunteers from each department before I leave today. And Jesus. My supervisor was behind me and went, Phew. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I just thought, oh my God, what am I getting into? But actually, it was kind of cool because I got to work on procedures for my department and also for other departments. And then, Spencer, I got into auditing, internal sure. auditing and then supplier auditing. And all of that stuff, I got exposed to different ways of meeting quality standards. And I found that really valuable. Um, got a lot of lessons learned from other places, what to do, what not to do. So that was very cool. And I really saw the value of standardization and how much easier the job got after you really put in a good solid quality management system. And I know that sounds really nerdy, but it's true. Um, the tough part, Spencer, is when you start out, you know, and there's yeah. nothing there and you've got to just grind and get all the procedures done and figure out what's going to work programmatically for your organization, but also meet the standards that you need to meet and all of the regulatory requirements and customer requirements. But once you do that and you kind of get in this groove, it really does help kind of smooth the business out. People kind of get in groove, they know what they're doing, and it becomes a little bit more fun and gives you more opportunities as a business to grow. So that's what I really dig about it. But round and back, I just kind of got sucked into it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of our mutual colleagues, Zach, I asked him the same question. He said, I didn't choose quality, quality chose me. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> So it's just interesting. That's kind of universal whenever I talk to the limited number of quality people I hang out with. Right, right. And they're probably pretty nerdy, too. I'm that makes sense. Saying. Like Patrick. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's about, you know, the business of how I got in. And um, it was really weird because after that position, I was there for several years and um, really enjoyed it and kind of wanted to spread my wings and do some other stuff. And I still ended up back in quality. And it didn't matter where I went, I ended up back in quality. And, um, but I really enjoyed it. Um, and I do still enjoy it. I really like the challenge of, you know, meeting new requirements and, and getting other people on board, training them. And really now that I'm a million years old, I really like to, you know, kind of mentor people and set up the next generation of leaders. I think that's really important as someone with a little bit of experience and um, something I really like to share and, and hope will benefit the company that I'm working for now, Form Logic. Just throwing a plug out there, but um, you know, 
I, I'm really hoping to, to make a good contribution. So That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess to go back into the story, like what were you doing when you got voluntold to get into quality? Oh my goodness, I was a mechanical design engineer. Nice. Yeah, I drew pictures basically. You know, and back then you were literally drawing pictures um, on CBS. This was paper drafting. Yes, paper wow. drafting. We did a little bit of, you know, we started morphing into the computer aided drafting and design, but a lot of it was still on paper back then. And um, CPS with our electric eraser buzzing it off like a little <laughs> dentist drill. <laughs> so, um, you know, doing that, um, designing those chemical process systems for a lot of different industries, pulp and paper, cool. um, fatty acid degassing, so a lot of stuff for like the food industry. That's awesome. Um, power piping, stuff like that. Like power I, piping? Power piping. So what there's is that? special, um, like there's an ASME standard and special regulations you need to meet for power piping, lethal service piping, all kinds of stuff. And also my nerdy little quality spidey sense was kind of kicked in there too, because you have to meet all of those requirements. And I kind of dug being able to do that. Nice. I'm um, going to get this out of your way. Though. Oh, well, well, thank you. No problem. They're magnetic. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, kind of crazy just came, yeah. kept evolving and so you also mentioned uh being able to bring in creativity and that being fun but i don't really think a standards is allowing for a ton of creativity <laughs> so i'm curious to hear kind of how that gets into it and uh what that looks like well you know it it is interesting because quality if you're looking at regulations that's laws right regulations industry standards, big, boring documents, boring, right? <laughs> but how do we make them not boring? Well, we have to train everybody this stuff and it can be miserable. You, you wanna see people fall asleep in training, let's talk quality, right? So you have to spice it up, you gotta make it a little bit fun. So finding ways to do that is really important. Um, I like to incorporate jokes you know um <laughs> visual aids are really important to have something tactile for people to see and understand and just having a little bit of fun keeping things a little bit more verbal and communicating that way challenging people in the middle of things so they don't start snoozing but i like to incorporate my cats what um, <laughs> um, but in other things, you know, we, we put little cartoons and, and things in and really try to have a little bit of fun uh, with things so that people can relate and they're not just looking at, well, here's a bunch of rules that I have to meet and, well, that sucks. No, you know, so if you make it a little bit of fun and really incorporate the why behind those rules, then people get it, it will resonate with them. And also sharing the consequences of not doing things the right way, that really helps drive home the message and people can really understand that. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Like, at least when it comes to safety, I'm a big fan of showing horrible shop injuries. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> and then there's the catastrophic injuries. Yeah. But, um, and you know, you kind of laugh about it, but it is dead serious. And I mean dead serious, you know, one thing that we, um, incorporate into the training that I incorporate into the training is talking about failure analysis and identification and traceability, which is so important because, you know, if there is some sort of catastrophic, cat, what, what? Cataclysmic catastrophic, <laughs> cat, cats, what? I'm back to cats. No. Can you if show the back of your show at some point? Well, <laughs> yes. But if there is a catastrophic event, we're required to support investigations around the root cause and really help understand what goes on. And um, it's so important. I shared recently with, with the Forum Logic team a story about a, a tragic accident in Sioux City, Iowa that happened. And what ultimately it boiled down to was they were looking at material records that were over 19 years old oh, wow. to really try to understand what happened in this plane crash. And they were able to discern the actual cause of that. I'm going to throw a shout out of Hard Alpha 
to Nick Lazuski. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, you know, it really kind of resonated with the, with the team because understanding that their records, the things that they sign off on are so important and they can be used to support a life or death decision or consequence and can be looked at years and years from now. Um, it's really important to have good, legible records and that you're doing things the right way every day, regardless of someone's there watching or not. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, if 19 years later, it, those records right. still need to be immaculate to be able to determine the root cause of a failure. Right. And yeah, there's no excuse not to. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's tough to really understand sometimes if you haven't come from a regulated industry or if you're really young in your career, early in your career, and you haven't been exposed to a lot of things like record keeping, um, it's important to really get that message out so that people know the consequences of their actions or inactions and how important those records really can be. So do you have any like methods besides showing case studies to really drive the point home? Um, actually, just internal things that happen. Um, you know, if there's a little bit of a hiccup on the shop floor, if there's something that doesn't particularly run well on the first run, um, being able to trace back events really can help us through those difficult times and figure out, you know, hey, do we have to tweak the program on this op or do we have to go back to this line of code? And we would never know that if there wasn't good per unit traceability. So really understanding, you know, what machine did this run on, which operator ran it, what time, and all of that stuff, that's really important. And getting them to know and say, hey, this is this part and we need to figure this out. And they're, oh yeah, that, that ran like crap last night. Well, tell me more and you know, just kind of pulling those things out and then showing them how we can solve problems with those little pieces of information is really kind of cool because then they get it. They're like, oh man, yeah, I don't need to be afraid to write something down that was a problem. I need to communicate the problem so that we can solve it. Because yeah. you can't fix what you don't know, right? Yeah, and without communicating to the rest of the team, I mean, you're not utilizing a lot of people's brains. Right, and some people have bigger brains than others. That's certainly true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Some people have more cats than others. Oh, I should, what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, so for people watching a video, Michelle showed me the back of her shirt when we started recording this. If you're comfortable okay, showing it, <laughs> I think this is worth saying. I, I don't know if I got it on camera. Yeah, that's on camera. Yeah, so, uh, Carl, if you can zoom in on that at all. I don't know if we can do any video magic, but I, I love this and I want everybody to see it. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. yes. So, I dig my cats, all things cats. But, um, yeah. you know, it's harmless so, for crying out loud. One of the first times I met Michelle, uh, she had a hardtop BMW convertible with a license plate cat lady. And I just thought to myself, I'm going to be friends with this person. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think it's part of the kookiness quality because you've got the dead serious side with your regulations and standards. And, yeah. You know, you really do need to be able to blow off steam and get a little kooky sometimes. So, um, you know, I do like to have a little fun and, yeah. and I think that's important. Well, even though I, I'm not like a quality professional myself, I mean, at least doing like early stage new product development, I, this is probably going to sound bad, but I actively recruit people with a good sense of humor. Like yes. if I'm going to be working long hours alongside someone, it helps if you can crack a joke every now and again because, you know, it's just, it's culture fit. I mean, right, right. you want to be able to enjoy those, that time and, you, like you said, blow off steam and, you know, then you can sort of focus in more when you have to because you don't feel so tense all of the time. Yeah, because, you know, especially in, like, tech startups and things like that, you know, you, you end up in really high-pressure situations sometimes. You have deadlines you need to meet, you have investors you need to cater to, and... And, and really hit milestones, and, and to be able to support that, sometimes you're putting in some really long hours, and, and there can be some stress involved, and so it's good to be able to just kind of kick it and relax a little bit, and um, 
have a little bit of fun while you're getting, getting stuff done. done. Um, yeah, couldn't agree more. Do you want water, by the way? Oh, I'll have that after I have a little, little splash good. of yeah. other refreshments. Yeah, we're drinking yes. this mezcal today, which is uh, quite good. Quite lovely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Vago, if you're watching this, uh, pay us, <laughs> please. <laughs> they won't. <laughs> Maybe not you, Spencer, but me, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle's uh, bank account number is. is? Um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I mean, Spencer actually put together a little procedure, a little work instruction with me. Remember that? I do remember that. Yeah, that was actually really fun to work with you on. And I learned a lot. Uh, you were an excellent mentor in that circumstance. And, uh, I really appreciate the help. Um, we were working on a secondary process and Michelle pulled me aside and said, we've got to put this into the quality management system. Um, and I said, of course, whatever you want. And I did a horrible attempt at writing a quality document. Uh, <laughs> Michelle bled red all over it. And we ended up with a, a neat little procedure at the end of it that we could hand off to a vendor. And it was, uh, it was quite nice. I, yeah, it was a good little process. I've been advocating for that sort of thing in my work ever since. Yeah, and you know, I tortured Spencer with some quality training, which was spectacular, I'm sure. Yeah, it was, I mean, it wasn't bad, right? Like, I, I think the way that you set it up, I mean, it, it was... Yeah, it's pretty decent. Yeah, it's I mean, straightforward. Yeah. We're doing a lot more live training now, um, but a lot more for the te technical type people. Yeah. Um, we'll get maybe the digital training. For um, shop-oriented personnel, we'll definitely do more of the hands-on training where they get a little bit more focused. Um, activities and things that are really kind of dialed into what they need to know for the shop floor are really important things like that identification, traceability, making sure that they understand um, what tags mean, what nice. sign-off means, um, what good workmanship is. Um, talk about workmanship standards for an object degree and control. Don't want that around. No, no we don't. Yeah. It's it's devastating. For anyone listening, foreign objects and debris is anything that shouldn't be there, usually in the context of an aerospace part or assembly. Right. Like, and for instance, there's that story where, uh, was it one of the Apollo missions where they found a whole wrench inside the... <laughs> Lunar lander. Slightly devastating. And one of the door panels. That would be considered foreign objects and debris. Yeah. 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 And, you know, for a larger air, like a, an airline manufacturer, you can run into the like, billions of dollars every year. You know, Just from the damage yes. caused by FOD? Yes. You know, I mean. Okay, so I know about like, like a piece of metal falling into a board and shorting it out. That's like yeah. one example of something yeah. FOD can do. Maybe punching through like a delicate material and, and making a hole, especially at high velocities and accelerations. Leaving a rag inside an assembly, and particularly when you're talking about aircraft and, and, and maintenance and things like that. What would that do? Like, what's the failure mode? Neutral. Flaming aircraft? I mean, you know, you can have really devastating consequences. I guess if the surface heats up and you've got something with a low kindling temperature like that. Yeah, and there's a lot of different things that could happen. You know, mechanicals can jam if there's that makes sense. something. Like an aileron or a anything. control surface. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it could happen with anything. And, you know, anything from, you know, a, a little piece of lime that someone <laughs> left. I mean, hey, um, it could be anything. It could be a nut, bolt, wrench. Any kind of tool. actually, it could be the pen, the cap from your pen. I, I, I'm yeah. gonna grab something just to, to show an example of something that failed due to fog. Uh oh, <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing. But I can't believe it happened here, Spencer. It, it did happen it's right here in this right? very room. <laughs> yes, so this was uh, this was for a demo we did during uh, during the pan dizzle. And basically, what had happened was we were using these little robots through an obstacle course, it was for an ASME event, uh, the inspection and maintenance robot summit. So we had people driving these over the internet to go through a course and spot potential dangers to human life. And while somebody from DuPont, a robotics engineer, was driving this thing, it just stopped working all of a sudden in the middle of that tunnel over there with 18 inch diameter. And I had to uh, take off my suit, <laughs> like at least the top part of it, and crawl into my back. And because we have uh, sand in there to have abrasion so it grips better, um, I 
braided up my back. Oh, lovely. And when I grabbed this, I realized that a bolt that hadn't been loctited properly had shaken loose and uh, fallen onto the um, computer that controls this thing and shorted it out. Yeah. So, foreign objects and debris. Lovely. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that can happen. And um... Luckily, the guy was a robotics engineer and was very understanding. Nice. I'd seen a lot of stuff nice. go wrong. Yeah. I mean, stuff like that's important to really kind of ingrain into people's mind because when you're at a precision machine shop like, like I am, like we are, and it's like, you know, you're making parts that can go into bigger assemblies, and if we happen to leave something there, we don't know what effect it could have. We can only imagine, you know, because we're not the design entity, we have to make sure that things are clean, things are done the way that they're supposed to be, and everything's in spec and in tolerance, and, um, you know, really getting that point across, and again, driving that, you know, FOD mitigation is really a huge part of that. Um, our customers really, really strongly appreciate that and the efforts we put into it. And um, we're doing more and more all the time. You got more sticky mats and little zones we have set up nice. to be able to just kind of keep things where they need to be. And, you know, we're really reducing the amount of, of chips that you see. So if we do happen to see something, people are running over and sweep it up and clean it up. That's awesome. Really, really quickly and effectively and keeping all the horizontal surfaces clean, not storing things where they're not supposed to be. Everything uh, is in its place and has homes. And um, That's we're, great. we're doing more and more to organize. You know, we're a new shop. We're a new, new organization. So... We had a little bit of work, you know, to get off the ground and get things organized, but things are really coming together and, and are really looking strong right now. Really clean, um, fog free environment. Once in a while, if I see something, we'll have a brief talk about it and what we can do and, and you know, moving forward from that, it's, you don't see it again. So nice. people are learning, they're responding, and it's really fantastic. That's great that people have the resources they need to succeed in that way. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you get like an initiative like that adopted? Because I would imagine sometimes you've got resistance in a newer shop on something like that. Huh, well, you know, it's really just getting the leadership behind and people to lead by example. Awesome. So you know, and and really trying to work with people to make things comfortable for them. You know, I can make recommendations, but I can't go into your work area and organize it for you. I can make suggestions on how things might be better, but you are the master of your own destiny and you are the expert at your own job. And that's what I like to tell people. You are the expert at your own job. I'm not. I know some things about it and I know some things that can help to make it better and let's work together on that. So you're almost like a consultant. Yeah, like you can't force things on people because people don't dig that at all. Great. Um, so you have to be able to work with them and kind of make recommendations and definitely encourage and and you know celebrate the wins and what you see that's good smart and if something isn't so great you just say hey that's not so great but it's an improvement from where it was and let's keep working on it that's so, awesome yeah i think that's a healthy way to go about it yeah you know we try not to use brute force right yeah so <laughs> no. but um we really Unless you have do to. <laughs> um we really just try to be encouraging and um work with you know as teams and things like that and the team keeps growing so that's that's kind of cool too because the more people that you can get involved that bring different perspectives it's very very cool because people come from different industries medical device or you know aerospace or they'll come from just a pure machine shop background um, and some people just came from retail or you know it could be anything. There's people from all kinds of backgrounds. Nice. So it's very, very cool because everybody's got different ideas on how to make things happen. And it's 
not always who you suspect is going to have the greatest idea. That's why it's cool to be open. Can you to give me an ideas. example of one of those ideas that came kind of bottom up and sort of changed um, things for the better? Not right now, Spencer. Oh, it's all good. I'm just. <laughs> like, I ask a lot of penetrating questions, but you don't have to answer them. <laughs> I'm like, that's too much stress on my brain right now. No worries, sister. But, uh, we can edit that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, but um, good. yeah. So, I mean. Things are going well. They're starting to kind of take off. Um, what else can you do? So, I, I, I mean, this is a bit of a change of pace. And, yes. I mean, but what I'm always interested in this show is, is kind of hearing about crazy things that have happened during someone's career <laughs> and some of the, I call them war stories, of oh like things goodness. that you've seen that most people, unless they were in that sort of role or position, will never get to see. Because I'd like to show the spotlight on that sort of thing to, to the layperson. Sure. Well, I mean, in quality, you can see all kinds of crazy things. And it really depends on what industry you're in at the time. Um, yeah, but you've done nuke, you've done aerospace. Yeah, you've... Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, I've done things where I've had to go stand in front of giant meetings where there were, you know, representatives from the Public Utilities Commission and people really angry, you know, <laughs> about what's going on with nuclear builds and things like that and have to stand there and talk about what we're doing to work with suppliers and do corrective actions at the at the build sites and things like that. And, you know, it can be really high stress, but also very rewarding I agree when with you, kind of you see results when your suppliers really partner with you when your customers partner with you and everyone's working together for the common goal of making things right that's very cool um also you know way back in the day i was a uh, mechanical test technician and, and um I did all kinds of crazy stuff. I did some internal auditing there and was in charge of the calibration program and in charge of the mechanical test lab and also did some hot rolling and all kinds of other stuff, heat treatment and things like that. And cool. I actually caught on fire once, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> You've told me about this for people I listening. I did. I, I, you know, it's an incredible like, story. It was so weird. You know, you're, you're, we were rigging up a, a, over a pit furnace. There was this big pit furnace. And so I what is a pit furnace just for some idiot like me that's never worked around one? It is literally what it sounds like. There okay, is so a, a big gigantic hole, fire in it. hole in the ground that is hot as all get out and um it was i can't remember exactly how hot it was but maybe like 2300 degrees or so okay no joke right Fahrenheit we're or treating it f okay so we're treating steel and, and various grades of steel and um i remember we're trying to rig this thing up and i was working with someone else and we're trying to put this hook on this little cage that has all these parts in it and you know the furnace is just hot hot and i'm dressed in the baked potato suit classic <laughs> baked potato suit very very fashionable how thick is one of those things actually when well, you're wearing it's it? it's not system. really that thick it's just kind of cumbersome and, got it you know a little stiff if i'm you picturing will. like an iraq war era bomb disarming it's, suit but yeah, maybe more baked kinda, potato -y. yeah very baked potato -y. So, you know, you've got the spats on and these really giant thick gloves and a heat shield helmet and stuff. And underneath that, I had on greens and I had on, you know, welding greens and yeah. a cotton denim shirt and then a, like a cotton long john type shirt. And we were taking a little while to rig this thing up. There was, it was just not cooperating. You know, kind of had to shimmy it and um it was taking irregularly long and we finally got and i also i smelled something hmm, that's smoky and uh, oh my god that's me <laughs> like, holy crap you know it's like oh you hit the button and you, you know get the load out and you know then you stop drop and roll right and <laughs> 
Um, so I did that and I kind of got everything under control and, you know, took everything off. And, you know, the shield is melted over. It's Jesus. all warped up. But I had all of this hair that was just burnt off and kind of my eyebrow. And it smelled really burnt hair. It's a horrible smell. Very, very bad smell. Very bad smell. So amazingly, though, there was no real burn. I had a little tiny pink spot on my arm. And do you know what really happened? There was a teeny, teeny, tiny pinhole. That's it. Pinhole in my glove. And they were rated for like nine billion zillion degrees, right? Unless so, there's a pinhole. Right. So, you know, I always check my stuff before I wear it, like every time. But I didn't notice it. It was a little teeny pinhole. Is there any way it could have been a voice? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, so anyway, we, um, I was like, oh, crap, you know. So I had this, the little baked potato suit. The, the, so, you know, let's get back to the pinhole, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> so the really super, super hot air, like, zooms up this glove and kind of went up. And that's what kind of... The really hot uh, air burnt my hair. Through a pinhole? Through a tiny pinhole because it was just so it wasn't so even hot. really fire that came in. It, it was just the hot air and then it became right. fire when it, it contacted your hair. It became fire when it, yes, and that was unfortunate. And really there was a little bit of burn on the greens. They were burnt through a little tiny spot. It's good you were wearing the greens. And, yes. So I always doubled up, you know. I'm, I'm a protection girl. PPE, way to go. And, Amen. Um, so I had that, I had the greens on, the denim, it burnt through those just a little bit, and I just had a little tiny pink spot on my arm. But the hair That's was lucky. kind <laughs> of devastating so because I was more in my youth, of course. <laughs> but, you know. I remember being more in my youth. We did, right. So we <laughs> did do an investigation on that and really just kind of put in a little bit more of a program to make sure we were looking at our PPE more often and really giving it the once over before we used it because we always did check it but we didn't you know I looked at but I didn't like so stare at it. if there was a little dot it could have been like a piece of dirt or something and I just didn't notice it interesting and here it was a pinhole so I I worked at a company where somebody amputated their thumb uh, it was actually my boss at the time so it was, um, Did you like your boss? No, he was a total jerk. Oh my <laughs> so, goodness! Wow. Well. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I didn't want him to lose his thumb. Right. But he was he was operating a chop saw, like a Dewalt chop saw. Right. Uh, he was cutting aluminum eighty twenty extrusion. He had his finger behind the chop saw. Forgive me if I've told this story out here before, but but he brought the chop saw down. The extrusion pinched his finger against the backstop, and he lost his thumb. And so um, after that, um, the safety people got a hold of it and made some, I think, wrong conclusions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we had to do was wear cut-proof gloves when using scissors in the office area, which didn't really make sense to me, or dikes um, you like to cut wire with. That's a little bit of overkill perhaps yeah, yeah. <laughs> well and i would say even maybe in yeah. some cases more dangerous like the people when i would sure. go into the tool and die shop um or the tooling shop would be using um cut proof gloves operating lathes which can be really dangerous because you lose yeah. dexterity and and the gloves can get sucked into the machine yeah you don't want that with rotating equipment 100 percent agree terrible. yeah That's and crazy. so I, I don't know what it was but they they just i don't think they correctly designed that safety program right so I'd be curious, um, what were some of the things that the people did at that uh, company to, to check the suits and how is that maybe a more effective program? It was just a little bit more like a checklist type thing. Okay, like I like checklists a lot. Yeah, it, it was like driving you to really look at things or be accountable to look at them. So, you know, it did, it did really make you look at it. Well, because you, know, you don't sign off on something you didn't do, right? Right, kids? That's yeah. right. Well, the psychological yeah. effect of signing off, I think, is a powerful one. Sure. And so yeah. when you give someone that responsibility, I mean, yeah. occasionally they'll be rushed and they'll sign off on it anyway. Yeah. But most of the time, I think, people will really think twice before they put their name on something. Yeah. 
So that's that's cool. Yeah. And then you mentioned saving the load. So I'm kind of, what did it take to do that? Like being on fire? Like what did you actually have to slow down? Um, and... it, it wasn't even slowing down. It was just being, you know, cognizant of hitting that button to get the load out of there quickly so that if it just hung over that pit furnace, it was going to continue to heat and uh... heat. And then also just, you know, the cage could have melted and, you know. So it would be really, really dangerous if people could have have gotten seriously It it could have been way worse, but um, really I felt, you know, I wanted to make sure that I was taking care of myself, doing what you needed to do in terms of like, oh, when when you realize that you're, you know, en fuego, you (laughs) you want to do something about it. But also, it was like that magic moment. Both of those things crossed my mind at the same time, so I was just really dope i grabbed the like pen yeah and i got it and i kind of threw myself on the floor at the same time that's amazing it was it was well i had such dexterity back then right <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um yeah. well just to know to do that i feel like it takes like a person of integrity to to have their head about them and be able to yeah i think it's just being sharp and really thinking about what you do and being safety minded and, and yeah. stuff like that. But also good in a crisis. Yeah. And you know, I, I still think about that today. Like just thinking about things like, um, making sure that people recognize when there's a problem that you deal with it. You know, just the other day we had a water delivery, right? Those big five gallon <laughs> things of water. Oh, yes. And you know, from time to time you get a leaker, right? As you do, yeah, we've gotten them here. Everybody gets them. Um, So you come in in the morning at six o'clock, you walk into the break room and zing! (laughs) So, you know, you go, well, you know, you can leave it and walk away, but why would you? Because the next guy might not be going as slow as you were and really end up in a bad position. So Yeah, for sure. Nobody wants to clean up someone's brand off the floor. Right. I would much rather just mop up the water. (laughs) <laughs> so I will, you know, I'll stop, I'll clean that up, I'll get some help dumping the five gallon thing in because, you know, I'm ancient and I can't do things <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it's like, sure you could have done it. I, well, I try yeah. not to because, yeah. you know, I just, I have a messed up tendon. So nah, I, I try, to, try to take care of that. My dad's but, an orthopedic um, surgeon. I could ask him oh, to look at that. spectacular. It. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, just trying to keep on the lookout for things is important. Um, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. No, I, th- cool. I think that's important. Yeah. I had an experience uh, not too long ago. I might have told you about this, um, where I, I walked in on a neighbor. Uh, so I heard this loud walked thud. Walked in on a neighbor? Well, I, I live in an apartment complex, oh, right? To, oh, yeah, carry to save on money. Specific. And so <laughs> we had a shared wall, and I, I heard a loud thud. And... You know, I thought, well, it's probably nothing, but just in case, I'm going to go knock on their door and see what's going sure. on. And I knocked on the door, and um, nobody answered, so I took it upon myself to enter the place anyway. And what I found was a uh, woman who had fallen and was in a puddle of blood. Oh, wow. And luckily, my cousin, who was with me at the time, we'd both gotten back from Elton John concert. And Having Fabulous. some celebratory drinks, <laughs> and he, um, I was like, James, I need you in here, stat. And he, he ran up, and um, you know, this this woman was unconscious. She was in a pool of her own blood. So the first thing he did was a wet check to make sure that you know her brain wasn't exposed and her skull yeah. hadn't cracked. Fabulous. And luckily, it hadn't. Uh, she was bleeding yeah. from the chin. We found out, so it could have been so much worse. Yeah. But it was at that moment I, I felt so powerless and, and helpless, and um, just kind of useless to be honest I mean that I didn't know any of the first aid stuff I needed I, I was so lucky to have an EMT with me but if I hadn't I mean I wouldn't have been able to do anything I would have been well sure you would useless. I mean number one you checked right you checked which is more than what a lot of people would have done and you've got 911 that's on true. your side so and we did call in the paramedics right. after that so I mean you did what it, it, it more than what a lot of people would do these days a lot of people would stand there, take a video, and kind of laugh and, oh, and run away. You know, I, I mean, it's it's a crazy world we live in. So. Yes, that's true. 
being able to kind of help people is a good thing. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And I'll never forget when the paramedic showed up. I mean, you could see, you could tell who'd been a paramedic for longer. There yeah. were two guys, and one of them just his face looked like trauma. Like there's no other way to explain. He looked like he'd seen death 23 other times that day. Possibly. Yeah. Yes. And then the other dude was young and he, he looked like he had seen trauma, but more recently he wasn't yeah. hard and yeah. closed off and, and, you know, jaded yet. He was, he was still young and had a little bit of glint of hope in his eye and, you know, was, was shocked and horrified. But the fact that he was shocked and horrified meant there was some humanity left in him. The first yeah. guy that showed up had he was he was gone. Yeah, you know? it's like it was. He yeah, was just numb to all yeah. of it, and you know, and he and he had to be, I think, to survive all sure. the things that he probably seen that day alone, and so that was interesting to observe. Um, I don't know. My takeaway was that I've been trying to learn first aid. I mean, I think you saw me practicing my suture right. like a little bit ago, and I've been getting better that. and better at it. Yeah, it's still abysmal, by the way, <laughs> but I'm trying. Yes. You know, I, I want to have. And so actually I cut my finger open a little bit ago when I was doing, I was, it's embarrassing. I was doing some work with power tools and I, I slipped with a pipe cutting tool and it, it got my finger. And again, very embarrassing. I was acting like an idiot. It shouldn't have happened. But when I was going for the first aid kit, one of my first thoughts is, oh, I could suture this. <laughs> so I opted not to because I didn't have a nice. sterile uh, force up, right? And I didn't want to infect the, the site and I had steri strips and, um, so you Nupiracin. just lick it off instead. No, I, so I knew it was going to start gushing. It, it was it was cut open, but it, it hadn't started bleeding yet. But anybody that's been injured enough or has been around injuries enough knows yeah. that like that's that's about to that's a geyser oh, waiting yeah. to happen. And so I, I hit it with steri strips. Um, I hit it with blood clotting agent, um, and then I threw mupirocin on top, and you then I got all the sauces. It. Woo. Yeah, well, you know I've been hurt a lot. <laughs> <laughs> More ways than one, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I, I I try to keep my first aid kits well stocked, so I had all the stuff lying around. Very nice. Thanks. But I want to get better. Oh, I, I, yes. I need to learn CPR still. I can tell a pulse in like four of the seven places, but I'm still not perfect at it. So what I'm trying to say is like the fact that you know that stuff is inspiring to me and it makes me want to be a better person. It's funny because... I can find a pulse on other people, but not myself. I'm always going like... I feel like it's difficult on yourself. The carotid is the easiest one to get, but... It's really funny. I, I yeah. just always kind of... I'm like, that feels kind of weak, Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's just weird. Yeah. yeah fair enough. Yeah. So, so Spencer, what else do you want to chat about, about today? Sure. So yeah. I think we got some good stories in. Um, We've heard a little bit about what Formlogic's up to, which is fascinating, and I'm really happy about that. Um, I guess we can't say really like where any of the stuff is going or, or what any of it's, it's going to going space. space. Yeah, it's going to space. <laughs> we could say that. Right. It's on the website. Exactly. For Pete's sake. Yes. So. Yeah. It is rocket science. Well, it's rocket manufacturing. Okay. But it sounds much cooler. When I worked at SpaceX, we had this pickup line that everybody would use in the bars, which even the janitor would be like, I'm a rocket scientist. Yes, <laughs> what do you of do? course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was only an intern. I didn't really, really work there, work there. But when I was there, everyone and their mom would say they were a rocket scientist. Sure. So. I mean, it's, it's very cool. It is very yeah. cool. Um, Talk it's, about being nerdy. Right. I mean, you know, you think about... The way manufacturing has changed over the years, you've got, you know, added manufacturing and the high precision manufacturing and the, and the, you know, automation and artificial intelligence that we have now that we're kind of deploying. And it's very cool. It's very nerdy. It's cool to be you nerdy. You feel good working on that stuff. Yeah. So, like, when I've worked on things that were going to space, I mean, you feel like a badass. Like, I mean, there's... Yeah, I mean... Every nerd, I think, you go to a science museum and then you see stuff being made now that's actually going to go up there. And that is so much cooler, like, by an order of magnitude or more. Yeah, I mean, it, it is neat because, you know, you can... You can more readily see the fruits of your labor, whereas, you know... I think in days of yore, you know, particularly earlier in my career, you know, 
you could design things. And even though we had an on-site fabrication facility, unless you actually went to an install or a customer site for service or something, you weren't going to see the things being used or see how it really impacted. I don't know, there was just something missing in terms of impact of your work. And, and now being able to see like launches and everyone get excited and you know, oh, that satellite's going on, what's going on in this rocket? Oh, I think I made room for that, what? So that kind of stuff is very cool, you know, and it's, it's really, it's, it's neat. It's just neat. You know, back when I was just a tot, <laughs> in high school, um, my one of my teachers was in the um, teacher in space program. Cool. And Pat Palazzolo, shout out to you, girl. Yes, that's awesome. Um, so loved her, and really, it was a big deal. You know, the space shuttle, and oh, let's go to space. You know, and um, you know, we know the program ended up, you know, in tragedy and everything, but at the same time, what one of the exploded it did, trolls. yeah, what it did for kids is it really got them into science. It got them into math and science and space and engineering, and, you know. That's awesome. It really drove that little spark that I think a lot of kids, you know, maybe had it, but now you got it. You know, yeah. and although it ended, unfortunately, it it really kind of, it was big for me, and I, I know it was big for a lot of other people at the same time, um, and now to still be kind of contributing to stuff yeah. that goes into space, heck yeah, I'm well, excited about it. You it's, know? it's funny you should mention that, because my kindergarten teacher's husband was an astronaut, and Imagine that. It's a, just to be adjacent to something like that, you know, like two steps removed. I mean, this was my teacher's husband. Yeah. Inspired me. And, yeah. Uh, I think the guy's name was Jay Apt, and her name was Judy Apt. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, no, it, it makes you. It, it's inspiring, right? I mean, it's it's one of the pinnacles right. of human achievement, and, and to be anywhere near that, I think, is it. It really yeah. sort of makes you aspire to, to do better stuff than, than you otherwise might. Yeah. And you know what? I do want to mention one thing about the early space program with like the Challenger program and everything. Look that up. And you look at that team. Look at that team. It is a diverse team. It is a very diverse team. Is it with the astronauts, the engineers, yes. both? Yes. Okay, the astronauts. Very, very diverse. And you know what? I think that's what helped to make them successful and accessible. Well, and NASA's really always been like that, as far as I yeah, it, it can remember. It appealed to people. Yeah. Because you know? it, it was like, you know, I could I could relate to that. There's there's a woman with a you know PhD in engineering, and she's got to run the robot arm. Wow, that is cool. You know, yeah. like, all of that, it, it just drives you to go, hey, I can do that too. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter, it, you know, what background you're from, you can do it, and and there's opportunity there. So, I think it's cool, and there's there's opportunity now to get into things. It's it's funny because sometimes, you know, look at deliveries at work, and um, people will come in. You know, maybe the, they will deliver rocks, or they'll deliver just mail, or you know, maybe it's a, a dumpster vendor. It could be anybody. And a lot of people, they look around and they're like, what is this place? What, what is this? What are you doing? What are you making? What's, what's going on back there? <laughs> and so you tell them a little bit and yeah. they, wow, you must be really smart. I, can't, I, could, I couldn't ever work here. I'm like, you know what? You're working right now. Guess what? If you get up and you've got the fire to go to work every day, come on down. We've got work for you. That's awesome. What's really cool about what Form Logic is doing is we're taking that 
the proprietary technology that we're building and allowing it to basically have an operator who has very little to almost no experience and within just a couple of weeks be able to use the software and apply it to be able to manufacture precision machined components within like five microns. It's pretty, yeah. pretty darn spectacular. I agree. It's super impressive. I mean, it takes away having to build that skill set of, you know, decades of standing in a machine and knowing, you know, all the different materials and speeds Turn the knob and back to make sure you eliminate the backlash and, you on know, the so, Bridgeport J-Head. Right. So taking that away is filling in a really big employment gap. And it's funny because, you know, back when I was younger, I would think about problems of the future, future problem solving and think about how, oh, robots are going to take away our jobs. And, <laughs> oh my God, it's something to be scared of. And today, experiencing it, it's quite the opposite. It's amazing that it's, at least where I'm at, from my perspective, it's building more opportunity and it's actually putting in factors of safety in the work environment because we're taking out a lot of the actions that are um, repetitive motion injury inducers, the heavy, heavy lifting and, and changing of, of things and vices and pallets and things like that, where you'd have to lean over and really strain your lower back with something yep. really heavy. And well, some of that stuff is heavier than can be lifted by a person. Right. I mean, you know, even with cranes and implements, just really dangerous to do so being able to take that element away and offer that bit of safety and repeatability and and allow people to focus on the things that they need to i think that's very cool and also again just bringing that ability to you know come in and fill that employment gap because right now there is a really big shortage of skilled machinists um, particularly after COVID a lot of folks that were maybe in their later later middle age or yeah. um, or towards retirement just went ahead and retired and didn't go back to work so there that broadened that gap even more so you know and you think about how our education system and, and just overall perception of what careers were in the last maybe 10, 15 years even, it took away from oh, you don't wanna you don't wanna go to a trade school, you need a degree, you need this. Well, you need I mean that. the fact that US doesn't even really it, it, manufacture, right? Yeah, or, yeah. or put trade schools with the respect they deserve. I mean right. we don't have right. the same kind of apprenticeship programs that even Germany has, you know, and it's yeah. I think we need to get better with that. Right. And so now that resulted in that really big skills gap for, you know, skilled manual labor. Like it's your hands-on labor that requires skills, knowledge, education, technical savvy. And, um, you know, we're, we're using our technology to kind of fill that gap in. And it's really amazing to see... Um, it's really improved even in the, you know, I've been there just under a year and it's really gone leaps and bounds from when I first started to now seeing the adjustments and automation happen that end up in successful parts. Yeah. It's, it's That's mind awesome. blowing. I mean, yeah. it's really exciting. I'm like, oh my God, these are, woo, you know, in the last, I'd say six months, we, we've about doubled that's personnel incredible. and um, you know it continues to grow so that's really great and again it's getting back to that you know the older mentality was thinking that it was going to replace jobs and, and take away from what people can do and it's really adding to what people can do and also changing and having you know different opportunities so now there's more of the preventive maintenance you've got robots you have to maintain them 
So there's that, again, that hands-on skill set. It is valuable. Having someone who's mechanically inclined is really, a, it, it's supreme, man. Like, go for it. If you're, if you're into cars, if you're into your, like, motorcycles or wrenching that on your bike. That shows passion. I mean, yeah. You know, and that, I'm glad you hit on that passion that's getting back to the people who you know what if you get up and you've got the fire to go to work every day if you've got passion you've got more than half the battle i mean that's <laughs> really what you need you what? need that fire to just giddy up i couldn't agree more yeah that seems like a good note to end on should we call it all right let's call it all right let's call it <laughs> oh, yeah. call it. cool well hey michelle thanks for coming oh, on it's been a hey, pleasure thank you spencer i i Zesty. We'll do yeah, it again. again. We'll talk cats. Oh, we should bring our cats. What? Lucky we would complain Lucky. so much if I brought her in the car. <laughs> she does not like driving around. But you know what? If you do it, I'll do it. Okay. Sweet. Cheers, sister. Thanks for coming.